Hi, and welcome to the online industry panel of Nordische Filmtage Lübeck 2020 uh, for this 62nd edition of the festival. Uh, we're not welcoming you in Lübeck in person, but we're like equally pleased to welcome you here virtually. Um, in this panel, we're going to talk about audience building for historical films in these unprecedented times. And uh, the title that we chose is a bit of an ambitious title. We called the panel Bringing the Past to the Future. So we will definitely talk about the past. We will definitely talk about the present also. And I hope that in the end we'll have some ideas for what the future might bring and how we can attack it. I'm very happy to be on this panel with you and to moderate it. My name is Lauren Dietrich. I'm the responsible for the Lübeck Meetings. Uh, Lübeck Meetings is the industry events of Nordische Filmtage Lübeck. And this year we have a 10-year anniversary with Lübeck Meetings. So it's a special uh, edition for us as well. And to start us off on this panel, uh, we want to show you a short clip uh, that's presenting the Bay of Lübeck as a location. Uh, this clip was produced by the Filmförderung Hamburg-Schleswig-Holstein. And after the clip, that gives you a bit of an idea what you're missing by not being in Lübeck, but sitting at home in, your computers, uh, in front of your computer screens. Uh, we're going to talk to Helga Albers, the Managing Director of the Filmförderung Hamburg-Schleswig-Holstein, uh, to welcome you all together. And then we'll have a set of panelists to discuss with two case studies how we can all work on historical films and uh, develop an audience and release these films uh, in the times that we live in now. So let's start off with the video. Ich habe euch hier heute mitgenommen in die Lübecker Bucht und das ist ein ganz besonderer Ort. Wir haben hier einfach eine unglaubliche maritime Vielfalt. Also du kannst hier Surfaufnahmen machen, Segelaufnahmen, du hast hier einfach wunderschöne Fischerorte. Vielleicht ist man ja nicht immer nur auf der Suche nach tollen Locations, sondern auch nach echten Charakteren. Und wenn man hier morgens um sieben längs kommt, dann äh, werden ja auch der Kabel ja auch vom Boot verkauft. Also das hat auch schon was, ich sag mal, wildromantisches. Wenn man ein bisschen ins Hinterland geht, hat man richtig tolle Landschaften mit Feldern und das ist immer ein wunderschöner Anblick, gerade im Frühling, wenn dann die Rapsfelder blühen und dann dieser Kontrast zwischen den Rapsfeldern und dem Blau des Meeres und des Himmels. Hier an der Ostsee ist alles so ein bisschen sanfter. Schön, oder? Ja. Oh. Lauren, can you hear me? I don't have a sound, but if you... Can you hear me? Yes, I can. It's more like a seance where everybody's saying all the time, can you hear me? Give me a sign. Is anybody there? But I'm not sure if we have you right now. If not, we'll just like move on and try to get you back in a minute or so, maybe. All right. All right, uh, I'm afraid Helge was lost in the online realm. But it's not a big uh, problem because we have other guests as well. So we'll just move over and I'll welcome the other guests. We'll hopefully get back Helga a bit later. And uh, I will talk to my other guests uh, and welcome here on the virtual panel Christina Rosendahl, the director of our opening film this year at the Nordische Filmtage Lübeck, The Good Traitor, uh, and the producer Jonas Frederiksson from Nimbus Film, who is Christina's producer. And uh, yeah, we're very happy to have you here on the panel. Uh, unfortunately, we couldn't hear what Helge from the Filmförderung Hamburg says because I have to say right now, we'll do that later maybe. But we're very happy that you're both here and a very warm welcome to you on the panel. So, uh, Christina, Christina, I just wanted to ask you a quick question. You just did the opening of the festival in an equally virtual format. How was that for you this year? I think it was okay, actually. Um, I, I think we have to get used to this kind of format. So. Um, and of course, I would have loved to be there and also meet the audience and the festival in, in, 
like physically, but I think um, I think the, the whole program and everything was really wonderful. So I I, I watched everything yesterday and it, it was really nice. So thank you for that. Yeah. It was wonderful for us also to have you here with us virtually at least. And we're really happy that you and Jonas are both here for this panel and that you will present in a few minutes a case study on your film and on the release of your film in Denmark because you did really interesting things with it this summer. So we're really curious to hear more about that. But let me first say hello to Jonas as well. Jonas, uh, you have the poster of your film in the background. So we get two faces for the price of one with your image. That's really amazing. How? Do you have that there all the time, or did you put it up especially for our panel today? Yeah, I put it up especially for the panel today because you. Uh, uh, normally, I have a, a calendar there, and you um, <laughs> worked on that yesterday. So I thought, you know, I'm going to take it down and put uh, something more inspiring in the background and more relevant than an empty calendar. <laughs> It does definitely look a bit visually more pleasing than the calendar you had there yeah. uh, at the same time. But it did give off a good image of you as a very organized producer, so the calendar was nice as well. Uh, we're super happy to have you both here. I'm just going to say hello to our other guests, and then in a few minutes we're going to be back with you, and you'll present as the second case study of this panel what you did with The Good Traitor for the Danish release. So don't go anywhere. Yes. Stay with us virtually, no, and um, yeah. we're looking forward to talking to you in a, in a, few, more, in a few minutes. Right, so, oh, there's Helge back. Yes, so, I'm back. So, so I'm staying here then. We'll, we'll, we'll adapt to the situation. Hi, Helge, there you are back. Hi, Lauren. Um, it, was so. it was good that you, lo that you were gone because I was starting to speak in German. The sound broke off. It was a big mess, everything here, but now we're back on track. So I'm back in English. You're back here. What I wanted to say was like, beautiful, right? Because that was the last words of that beautiful location trailer. And uh, we can no, get started I, on that. I found it absolutely mean and nasty to start it off with that trailer because it shows us what we're missing. I mean, it gives us something to look forward to in our next year, and this year we have to do as we do, uh, with all the technical hiccups we see. But I'm very happy we can do that after all, and we can discuss all the topics that we can discuss. Um, we picked a topic that is, that is um, challenging. Um, audience building is challenging in itself. Building in terms of Corona, even more difficult. Audience building in terms of Corona for historical films, for period pieces. Good luck with that panel. So I'm, I'm really interested to see where you arrive. Um, I want to thank you for organizing this so for the anniversary of the corporate uh, My thanks also to the Liebe Film Festival, especially Linde, who is last in this. So um, Linde, you already said, Goodbye, also, so we'll find a way to be in person for sure. And also, thanks to the team of the FFSR. So, I hope this kicks us off better than the, the first try. And um, good luck, and yeah, looking forward to learn. Thank you so much, Helge. <laughs> and then we'll hope to see you very soon in person in Lübeck again. I hope so too. <laughs> Bye, Helge. Thank you so much. All right. Now I'm moving this way to welcome the two guests that we'll have today who will present the first case study actually that we're presenting. So Dirk Decker and Henriette Ahrens. For now we still see Jonas, but in a minute we'll switch over to Dirk. There he is, Dirk, and there she is Henriette. Hi, welcome to the virtual panel. It's really nice to meet you here virtually. The good thing for me is Hello. I can come as close to you as I want. I don't have to wear a mask. I can get like this close to you. I don't have to do like one meter 50. Like this is the closest uh, human contact I've had in weeks. So I'm really happy about that. Uh, I'm just going to say uh, hello to Dirk first as the producer from Tam Tam Film of the second film that we're going to see as a case study and hear about as a case study today. Uh, Dirk, you're at home in Hamburg or where are you calling in from? Uh, I'm actually in the office in Hamburg, yeah. And is the office like your second home or do you spend more time working from home these days as well? Um, uh, I started uh, working from home uh, in the beginning of the pandemic, uh, the first months, and, but then at some point uh, I returned back to the office because it was a bit stressful at home with two small kids uh, as well. can imagine. Thank you so much. We're really happy to have you here and not only you as the producer and distributor of the film, but also Henriette. Henriette, uh, in the invitation, I put marketing and distribution for you for the part that you played in the release of the film that we're going to hear about. Maybe you can 
like tell us like a bit now already what you are doing in your professional life because I'm not entirely that clear about it and maybe some people at home aren't either without going into too many details but maybe you just want to say a quick hello and introduce yourself. Hi, um, yes, thank you for having me. Um, with this project uh, that we will talk about today, I uh, took on the role of marketing, basically, and we supported TumTum, -Tum, who is the official distributor of this film. And uh, in my everyday life, um, I founded a film distribution company with my colleague Ole Helvig in February. We actually went to the notary on February 28th. Um, to release a film, we didn't really see Corona coming, um, and now it's full on. So I guess that's something we'll also talk about later. Definitely, we'll definitely talk about uh, unprecedented and also unpredictable times. I, at some moment, thought we might be uh, have to change the title of our panel to unpredictable because that's how the world is right now. But we will definitely mm -hmm. talk about it and hear from you how you hopefully managed to react to the unpredictable changes or like came from plan A to plan B to plan C to, I don't know what letter you are at right now, but we'll definitely hear more about that. Um, before we start with your case study uh, that I'm really looking forward to, uh, and before we show the trailer for your film, so the people like watching us at home also have a bit of an idea what we're talking about, I just wanted to like um, say a very um, quick thank you um, to the people who initiated this event today, actually. Uh, I should have done that earlier, but with the whole confusion, I l forgot about it, but I remember it now, so I'm doing it now. Um, we're doing these events here in Lübeck in the framework of Lübeck meetings uh, together with the Creative Europe desk in Hamburg and Christiane Siemen and her, and her team. Uh, we're doing it with the Filmförderung Hamburg-Schleswig-Holstein. We saw Helge, but also Katrin Meersmann and Anna Doig and her team uh, are of uh, partners for us in this event. And this year we're also doing it for the first time with Ene Katrine Rasmussen from Creative Europe Desk in Denmark. So uh, for this year, uh, and that was also a bit the inspiration of the topic of the uh, panel that we're doing, uh, it's the 100 year anniversary uh, of the reunification of Southern Jutland with uh, Denmark. I practiced that for a long time to say it properly. I hope my history teacher is not watching from home. Um, and uh, th this marks the beginning of like the German-Danish uh, relations in a different way that uh, developed into friendship and into collaboration. Uh, that's why we're focusing on German films and on Danish films today, uh, on co-productions, but also on films that were produced in Denmark, but coming now to the festival here in Lübeck. And uh, yeah, the historical inspiration of this panel uh, also brought us to the idea of really looking closely at two historical films or period films, uh, if we want to call it that way. Um, so just like a quick shout out to the people that prepared and uh, initiated this panel with us. And I also want to mention Florian Vollmas, the former managing director of the Nordische Filmtag in Lübeck, who was part of this discussion together with Ene and um, with Christiane from Hamburg. So that's done and out of the way. The thank yous, I might do more at the end, but uh, for now this is done. And uh, Dirk and Henriette, I would propose that we start with watching the trailer for your film and then I'll give over the virtual uh, stage to you and you can start telling us about what happened with this film in Germany for you. Great. Okay, let's start the trailer then, please. Hvis det kom, jeg nogensinde kom tilbage igen. Jeg kan ikke vende hjem, Smith! Så rolig, det er mig. Jeg vil ikke tøge på det, så jeg tør en højfne sig. Vi må sådan dem nøje, de klarer magten, så jeg skal bare ikke acceptere den. Det er dejligt at se dig med farver igen. Han er fuldstændig forælsket. Hold nu op, Marie! Han var mig. Jeg vil rigtig gerne vide, hvis der er en mand, der har været meget med Kim. Vores. Det er kræft, det står. Det er strejende prostitution. Det er det, hvad jeg har spændt. Og sig, hvad jeg har spændt. Jeg ved ikke, hvad konsekvensen har, men det spørger jeg ikke. Hvad har det, jeg gjort? Du har ingen idé om, hvad jeg går igennem heroppe. Stop! Kastine! Jeg kan ikke kende dig. Nu skal jeg vente på dig igen. Ind der lige nu under krig. Ind der lige nu under krig. Skal 
Hjælp mig på mig igen. Jeg skal ikke tilbage til den krig. Jeg dør der nu. Men jeg vil ikke flygte. Jeg hører til det her. Vi er krig. Vi gør, hvad der er nødvendigt for at overleve. So, this was the trailer to A War Within by Kaspar Thorsting. Uh, the German title is Von Liebe und Krieg. And uh, just to mention that you, Dirk, produced this film from Tam Tam Film together with Frito Film in Denmark. And if the information that I researched is right, with Nord Film Kiel and uh, United Film in the Czech Republic. If I, got any of the if I got any of the credits wrong, I apologize, but hopefully not. Um, the film was supported by our partners, Creative Europe, uh, and also by the Filmförderung Hamburg-Schleswig-Holstein. And I had a talk with Katrin from the Filmförderung, who told me that it was uh, a very special support in the framework of a German-Danish co-production development initiative at a very early stage that you got supported. So uh, this That's brings us to the topic, or relates this film also to the topic of like German-Danish co-production and collaboration and hopefully friendship. I hope you had a very friendly relationship with your co-producers. And um, yeah, so I think the film as an historic film Uh, is a perfect example for like what we want to talk about. So I want to give over just the stage to you and hear what you, after producing the film and showing it also at Nordische Film Tage Lübeck in 2018, if I'm not wrong, uh, what happened next and what you were planning and what you were doing and how the world interfered or what happened. Tell us all about it. Yeah, thank you, Laurin. Um, as you mentioned, we also uh, produced the film and uh, we distributed the film in, in Germany. So I want to give you a short uh, introduction to the whole uh, production setup uh, of the film and then give over the word to uh, Henriette, who will talk more about the distribution side of it. Um, the film is a Danish-German uh, Czech co-production. Uh, it's a love story that is uh, set in World War One, as you uh, have noticed. Uh, and um, the, that was, uh, from the beginning, a very strong um, uh, uh, anchor for, for our production as it uh, evolves around the, uh, the story of Denmark and Germany at that time, where uh, southern Denmark was annexed by the German Reich and uh, like 30,000 young Danish men had to fight for Germany uh, in World War I. So this is a topic that was never addressed before in film and that was uh, the basis for our um, production and the, the release strategy also. Um, the film found a very strong support uh, both on the German side and on the Danish side in this uh, region. We shot the whole film in 34 days in completely in, in the region, with uh, some exceptions for some war scenes in Czech Republic. Um, and uh, the film was very much supported from the local uh, regions, like Turner and Sonderborg on the Danish side, from uh, uh, Danish companies uh, like Danfoss that are located in the region. And we found a strong support also from um, the people living in the region, actually, that supported the whole project, the production process uh, that accompanied it on uh, social media channels. So we knew that there was a lot of interest in, in this region already. Um, we shot the film in February, March 2018, and the strategy uh, or the aim was from the beginning to release the film in Denmark on the 11th of November in 2018, which was the 100th anniversary uh, of the end of World War I. And uh, yeah, we luckily we managed because it was a very tight uh, schedule. And we had um, the, the big gala premiere in Sonderborg uh, on the 11th of November 2018, which uh, with a, a Danish nationwide release afterwards, uh, where I think the Danish uh, distributor had like 75,000 admissions, uh, which is an okay figure. But uh, if we look at the numbers in this region, Uh, then we see that uh, the film had 45,000 admissions uh, only in southern Denmark, uh, which makes it one of the best-selling films in this region. So um, you see that uh, audience building in that region worked, worked very well. On the German side, we, uh, from the beginning, thought that this time frame is too 
too tight for us uh, to really release the film here. And uh, our plan was to wait for the Danish release to see how it goes there to build on, on the buzz that the project might create in, in this region, also on the Danish or the German side of the border. And then to gather maybe some festival uh, success uh, right afterwards and then to release the film with a good, good distribution partner um, beginning of 2020, because 2020 marks another uh, uh, historical year. It's the 100th anniversary uh, of the border uh, between Germany and uh, Denmark, which has a very special uh, history also, because um, uh, it was voted for by the people living in this region after World War I. And so the Denmark, Dan uh, the Danish German border uh, was voted and it's still uh, it's the same uh, today. So a very uh, positive uh, history. And um, after uh, the release in Denmark, we uh, thought for, we, we uh, were looking for a German distribution partner, um, but the distribution partners in Germany were very reluctant uh, because they found the uh, target audience too narrow. They saw that the target audience is uh, big in the northern German part, but they thought that it's too slow, too small for nationwide release. So that's why they uh, declined the project. Yeah. And um, we as a company already uh, distributed one other film where we had the same feedback from uh, distribution partners and uh, we dis distributed the film ourselves. It was a documentary uh, set in Hamburg and alone in Hamburg uh, in the end we made 15,000 admissions so we thought maybe this is also a positive uh, thing for the project that it has such a strong uh, rooted local audience that we can address and uh, we thought that it might be a chance also for us as a distribution company to uh, gain some more experience. And that's why we teamed up with uh, Henriette from Not Sold, uh, mm -hmm. a partner that we uh, had in mind uh, for collaborations for a while already, because we were very impressed by their earlier uh, release this year by their Finn Kliman documentary. And uh, we discussed how we can uh, promote this film in the northern region and uh, how we can attract <laughs> the northern German audience to uh, use this time that we had due to the postponed uh, productions uh, and uh, to, to release the film in this uh, very important year for the German-Danish uh, history. Thank you, Dirk. Yes, and um, we'll just give over to Henriette. Yeah, sorry, I'm interrupting you. I shouldn't have. You were just doing that <laughs> naturally anyway. So Henriette, yes, sorry. <laughs> That's no problem. Thank you so much. Um, yes, we are very happy when uh, Dirk approached us because um, we loved the film and we thought it was really interesting. And um, personally, I have to admit, I um, was not the most expert on this um, area of history, of German and Danish history. So um, that was very exciting. And we basically um, thought that we have to take an opportunity through flexibility because at the time screens were free in Germany, um, big films were being pushed. Um, we had available time and TomTom -tom obviously as well. So um, we thought we need to do it now or never. And on top of that, obviously it was still 220. So the year of um, German and Danish cultural friendship. Um, so we thought we want to make a start at the German-Danish border and uh, take the film south from there. And we learned, uh, first of all, from the Danish release, which I will talk about a bit um, later on as well, but also obviously from my uh, Finn Kliman documentary release, that it can be very rewarding um, to focus on a very specific narrow target group. So. Um, yeah, that's what we did. And so we obviously placed topics such as the uh, um, cultural year 2020 and the Danish minorities um, at the top of our list. And we had very wild ideas from taking, making a premiere on the German Danish border to um, generate a lot of attention because at the time a lot of drive in cinemas um, were like popping up all over the place. And we planned a cinema tour along the border with um, our director and as historians to um, do film talks. And um, 
Yeah, the Danish start of the film a bit different. I mean, they placed it different. Um, they released on the 11th of November, like Jack already said, so that obviously gives a strong focus on the war aspect of the film. And they obviously focused heavily on the love affair between the two main characters. And we changed that a bit. We went more towards the opening borders aspect and more on the friendship between Germany and Denmark. And we also focused on the triangular relationship between Aspen, like between two, the two main characters and Tom Blaschia, because he's obviously a very strong German name. And uh, with all of that, we were very happy that the Fifth uh, Fördern Hamburg Stiefel Kolstein supported us um, in our plan. And then we mm -hmm. moved forward and actually reached the target group. And we did that by talking to the group of Danish minority in Germany, which um, is obviously people who are German, but they feel Danish um, because of the history. And we really went in deep into that um, target group. We talked to PhD students who performed research um, with us. We talked to um, cultural German Danish associations, such as Kultkit and Interreg. We talked to people learning Danish because we released the film in um, a subtitled version as well. Mm -hmm. We talked to the Danish embassy and the Kiel State Chancery and the Flensburg Cultural Office. And we did a lot of press work, which uh, worked really well. And we got positive press all over Germany. But um, we also wanted to like dig in deep into that target group. So we, um, we had articles released in German newspapers that are written in Danish because they only want to reach like the Danish minority. And at some point I have to like proofread a, <laughs> an article that was in Danish. So <laughs> yeah, I learned a lot in this whole process. And um, we also targeted via Facebook, um, native and paid. And the native we did via Facebook groups, which is very interesting because they really, they bundle all of like the people of a specific interest at one certain point. So that was good. And yeah, and then we, released the film and um, started in Northern Germany and we were very enthusiastic to move on south, but um, then came Corona. So um, maybe moving on to Corona now is, um, yeah, how to, how to release a film in a time of uh, pandemic restrictions. To sum it up with constant reactions, as you already said, Laurin, and um, flexibility as a top priority because there is endless examples. I will name a few. We planned a premiere on the border. The borders were closed. We um, originally, the film, like cinemas had no films to show. And then um, suddenly they had a lot of films to show and they didn't necessarily love the film with the, uh, with the title, like with the, with the word war in the title. And drive-in theaters were very en vogue, and suddenly there were none anymore. The director was supposed to go on the cinema tour, but he was from Copenhagen. And then we said, okay, let's go on a cinema tour with Tom Blaschia. Um, but then he was from Berlin Kreuzberg, which was the first German risk area. Yes. And ironically today, we had a big event in Kiel where um, uh, von Liebe und Krieg would have been shown. Yeah. And a lot of high ranking guests would have come, but that didn't happen. So yeah, to sum it up, um, it was possible through flexibility and resilience. And um, because now we're not talking about restrictions today, we're talking about a ban. So um, I think historical films right now are no different situation than any other film. And um, it's a difficult time for the industry. And yeah, what's yeah, not influenced by the pandemic though is um, that the people who watch the film really loved the film because it was made mm -hmm. for them. And I think Dirk went on the cinema tour and he gathered a lot of positive experiences from that. So that was mm -hmm. very nice. Yeah. I think one aspect, Henriette, that you mentioned, of course, like this panel has really two sides of it. That is like, uh, like we can talk about like how to release films, all kinds of films in these times. And then we can talk about like how to release and how to build audiences for historical films. So uh, we're forcing these two aspects maybe together and they don't even belong together. But I think since we have like two case studies of historical films, uh, we might try to cover both a bit. So I think like resilience and reactivity, what you mentioned, uh, is of course key to release anything these days, any film, and to pretty much do anything these days. So, uh, and uh, yeah, we really appreciate that you in 
the middle of this process because it's not as if it's over now. You will still have to change and to adapt and to react and to be resilient. So we really appreciate that you take the time out and that you also dare to talk about it in the middle while it's happening. So it's of course easier to talk about things like in retrospect when they're done and you have made your peace with it. But yeah, we really appreciate your sharing your experiences and your ideas and also how you have to move from one idea to the next. So that's really, that's really nice of you. We really appreciate that. If you're okay with that, I'm sure we'll have more questions later. And uh, I'll use that opportunity also to tell the people at home or in their offices or wherever they're sitting in front of their screens that there is a chat function in the window where they see the screen uh, and they can log into that chat function and ask us questions. We might not be able to answer all questions, but we'll do our best here uh, to see what's happening in the chat and to give mm -hmm. any questions that you have in the chat into the panel when we open it up for discussion a bit later after hearing a second uh, short case study. And at the end of this panel, you'll also see my email address again. So if there's any questions, if you want to connect to anyone on the panel, uh, you don't have to take notes now. You don't have to uh, write down my email address or try to remember it or find it in your emails. You can just like wait till the end and then you'll see you again. And I'll be happy to connect you watching at home to all the panelists that we have on the panel here today, just so you know that as well. And um, with this, I won't say goodbye, but just like see you in a few minutes again to Dirk and Henriette. Thank you so much already. And uh, we'll move to a second case study. I'll move physically over here. And uh, then we'll have Christina and Jonas back on the screens. Hi, thanks for waiting. Um, before we start hearing from you how your experience was, uh, with audience building, with releasing the film, and uh, whatever you want to share as a case study. Uh, we're going to watch the trailer of your film as well. So I would say let's do that now, and then we'll come mm. back and uh, I'll give over to you, and uh, we're looking forward to hearing from you after we see the trailer. And who is this handsome stranger? America has been on my wish list for a long time, especially now with the current political situation in Europe. <laughs> we can also just lean us back and let Hitler take Europe. Should we do that? In the Danish neutrality politics, it's a balance game. If all the things are like that, then Hitler wins. When the war comes, then I have to fight for someone like him. Danish Embassy. Can I have a comment from the Danish ambassador about the Nazi invasion of Denmark? What are you going to do? Menneskeheden er ved at begå kollektivt selvmord. Vi skal ikke tage mod fra en regering, der ikke har fri vilje. Det her kan være begyndelsen til slutningen på Hitler. The Danish government is negotiating with the Germans. I'm considering establishing an independent embassy here in the United States. Du overvejer at gå imod kongen. Svigt det land! Will the United States support me? And recognize you as Denmark's government. The American people don't want to die for countries they put behind them. Do you remember what you used to tell me about diplomacy? It's 50% information and 50% gambling. So, gamble. I will no longer take orders from Denmark. My country is going through dark days. To the American people, being a Dane is being a coward. You have a problem, Mr. Kaufman. I know. I will work for the re-establishment of a free Denmark. Do they know that? You are the king. Now no, we shall succeed. I think they really have a diplomat just for a drink of champagne. Det ved jeg ikke noget om. Det virker som om, de er blevet gode til det. <laughs> so, after seeing these images, uh, I'll give over to you. Uh, we're very happy to have you, Christina, as the director of the film here and uh, Jonas as the producer of the film. Uh, different to the first case study, you were not like taking on the role as distributor. You had a distributor that you worked with. 
if I understand that correctly, but you were heavily involved in the release of the film. So we're really looking forward to hearing uh, from your experience with the release of the film in Denmark uh, in the summer of 2020. Good. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Good. Uh, because I'm going to start out uh, by uh, uh, framing um, uh, the special marketing concept uh, we, we uh, uh, did here, you know, how it uh, uh, came on, how we developed it, and then Christina will talk a little bit about how it was actually rolling it out. And at the end, we'll just say a little bit about what we learned from it. And just to start back, uh, we have been working in kind of two tracks with a uh, kind of conventional advertising focused campaign which has uh, mainly been driven by our distributor in Denmark, uh, SF Films, uh, and then a special concept, which was uh, a concept Christina and I was uh, very involved uh, in, which was um, a project working with exposing cultural value in the film. And uh, the reason why, uh, besides that it is a great interest uh, uh, in the work Christina and I are doing, is that uh, normally it is the DFI, you know, the Danish National um, Film Institute, who will get evaluated on creating cultural value uh, by the uh, Ministry of Culture in Denmark. And they have decided that this working with cultural value in films uh, is something that they will stimulate or uh, inspire, even maybe soon demand, the film workers in Denmark to work with themselves actively. Um, so uh, we decided uh, to go uh, full in on trying to uh, create a project uh, working with this. Um, and, um, uh, you know, uh, first of all, um, we kind of dig into the discussion that is going on in the whole industry uh, uh, right now in, in, in Denmark, trying to understand uh, what is cultural value, uh, because it can be anything. And um, uh, to us, um, uh, uh, it was actually taking back and trying to investigate in why we started off working with this film, uh, uh, because uh, we uh, 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 met or uh, bumped into Kaufman working with a, a, a film we did, uh, The Idealist, uh, some years back and uh, kind of uh, bumped into a rebel uh, because the story is about uh, a Danish diplomat working as an ambassador in Washington during the Second World War who kind of took his, the fate of his nation into his own hand. Even he knew it was a treacherous action um, and was inspired by these uh, heavily uh, radical actions he took. Uh, under the Second World War, which uh, more or less was to hand over uh, the biggest island in the world, Greenland, to the Americans, or the uh, defense uh, rights to it, and was uh, kind of inspired by his, uh, his uh, level of being a, uh, a rebel, and thought uh, maybe the impact he had on us could be uh, actively rolled out as an audience building uh, a project uh, for us to try to um, inspire people um, uh, to maybe uh, gain a little more uh, rebel attitude in their own life. Mm -hmm. um, so what we actually did was framing um, a four week long sustained cinema tour in Denmark uh, traveling uh, round between, I think, 26 or 27 uh, different cinemas um, where we had, uh, with help from a, a, a company that uh, helped, you know, creating uh, this concept, uh, had uh, recruited uh, today's local Kaufman in the local communities in Denmark. We were, uh, what we did was actually to find, you know, who would be the local Kaufman in different uh, cities uh, in Denmark today. 
uh, and uh, try to uh, to establish a conversation with uh, this rebel and Christina after the film, uh, talking about uh, what is the rebel's role in society today, what does it take, uh, who are they, these uh, rebels, and um, what are the costs of uh, being such one. Um, and uh, so you can say, uh, the, starting the conversation with the audience about this uh, rebelness was one criteria. The other one, which was very important, was uh, actually to have an experience with working with local media, which normally are difficult to activate on, uh, on a national film distribution because um, they need the local angle. Um, uh, but since we have recruited local well-known rebels uh, uh, all around in, in Denmark, uh, we thought we might have a chance uh, um, activating the local press to talk about uh, the event where their local hero would participate. Um, and um, we uh, rolled that out. And uh, maybe we, uh, we should swift now uh, to Christina to talk a little about yep. uh, 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 how um, it actually took place, and your own role in it. Um, sorry, I'm just being a little bit of a rebel here because my computer is running out of, <laughs> of electricity. That's Pardon all right. We, we don't want you to go black all of a sudden. That would be too rebellious. Huh? So feel free to plug in <laughs> at that moment. It is a rebellious thing to just leave in the middle of a panel. So you're really showing a good example of what you did actually during the campaign for the film. Huh? Uh, did you did you rehearse that or was that spontaneous? <laughs> that was totally spontaneous. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. I'm ready. I'm ready. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Let me tell you a little bit about uh, the findings that we did. So um, I think um, the two um, uh, viewpoints to look at this uh, the success of this rebel tour would have to be one with the audience and then two with the local cinema. Uh, owners. Um, so I think um, what we, uh, Jonas and I, were very uh, engaged in uh, when we were thinking out this concept together with this company called Made by Us was how can we use the film to create a mirror out uh, to the audience so that uh, instead of me traveling around and being like the classical director. Uh, Oracle, I, I have all the answers to all the audience's questions. I'm on a pedestal uh, being up there lonely. Uh, we just totally changed the focus and put the audience as the main characters. And I think um, also thinking a little bit about like, like uh, when we were thinking out this strategy, the, the world was hit by this COVID-19 pandemic. So, so the audiences were someone who had not been into the cinema for a very long time. And so by us going into the, the cinema, creating events and showing them, hey, it's not dangerous to go uh, into the cinema, it's a safe place. Um, and uh, that was one thing. But the other thing was that in people's minds right now, what they are engaged in is we are, we are in a big crisis. How, how do we meet the crisis? How do we solve all the problems? that uh, has hit uh, the planet right now. And so we, I used in these conversations with the local rebels, I used also the pandemic uh, situation uh, and, and talking about the films like the, the World War II crisis and, and talking about this, how do we, how do we, what would do we do as audiences or people when the big crisis hits us? And maybe Kaufman can teach us something or inspire um, you know, in the dilemma, should we trust uh, the system or should we praise the um, the people who who just walk alone with the big with the good ideas? And so, uh, what happened actually in the in this rebel tour that, that we were on was that in one small village in the south of Denmark, uh, the one of the the, the local rebel that uh, I met, she had uh, she was a, a children's novels writer. And she had, from, from collecting uh, rights money, she had bought a big house in the middle of the, of the town and gave it to the, uh, to, the, to the people of the town, just giving a house, not demanding anything back. 
And so what happened in the, in the session I had after the screening of the film was that, that it turned out to become a big brainstorm event where the whole city, like all the, the people in the, in the cinema, the audience, local people, would brainstorm what do, how do we want this house to hide like the happiness in our, in our, in our town. Um, in another event, uh, it was more kind of a philosophical discussion. We would talk about, we were looking at Black Lives Matter. Um, do you create change best uh, through anger? Or should you do as Henry Kaufman, uh, have great ideas? And, and um, so this was much more kind of an intellectual event that was created by this. But I think that, that, that what I found, or what that we found out was that that, uh, and this is a very radical idea for a director because the director up to this point is the uh, sort of the head of the whole thing and the artistic um, queen or king of the project. And so in, in order to, for this uh, engaging tragedy to work, the director needs to step back and let the audience become the main characters. Uh, so, um, and, and I think like the, with the local rebel and me just actually being much more of a moderator instead of the main character of the events, that was, uh, that was uh, I think that was very successful. Mm. And, and the other thing is that um, the other target we had was the local cinema owners. I think that here because of geography, uh, there's a lot of cinemas who feel that they are left out of the uh, of the bigger cities and then and, and so like normally when we go out on a tour with the actors so uh, we will go to the biggest uh, cities and the biggest theaters and do the promotion so what we did was to sort of go after all the very small cinemas and engaging in uh, them in, uh, in in also mm -hmm. finding the rebels and and uh and we did a lot of, of work uh, in order to help the, the local cinema owners to attract uh, the audiences for these events and, and sort of being available for their needs as well. And, um, and I, think, I think for a film also to have kind of both commercial and cultural success, it's important that the people that are, are um, bringing your film out to the audience, so this would be like the cinema owners or the local mm -hmm. journalists, mm -hmm. that they feel that, that these film people, they're, they're coming here, they're not just talking about the film, but they're actually talking about us out here. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, this, thank you so much for sharing this. I think it's really interesting. And I, what came to mind while I was listening to you is that there is a parallel also between the work that uh, Dirk and Henriette were doing by really taking audiences seriously and really engaging what, with what Henriette called a narrow target group, maybe, like local, smaller cinemas, uh, what you said now, and like really taking local communities or regional communities serious as audiences, even if they might be a narrow audience, but really like connecting on a deeper level with them. That seems to be something or like a shared idea that you both had for your films. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really interesting point. Um, I wanted to add maybe a question that came up in the chat. Um, there was the question about age groups. That's often like something if you connect to audiences, like the whole plan is like really centered on different age groups. Um, this was Cornelia who asked that. Cornelia Köhler, thanks for the question, Cornelia. Um, so maybe if you want to talk a bit about that, was that a factor for you, the age group, in the way that you planned it? Like what age groups did you uh, address most or was that like irrelevant for the concept that you had? Are you going to answer it, Christina? No, I think you... you, you, you. Uh, well, um, uh, the short answer uh, uh, would, would, would be it was not a, a specific criteria uh, for working with the cinema owners in promoting the uh, events. They went out um, uh, broadly to, um, uh, to their uh, most... Uh, um, resistant uh, local uh, audience uh, goers. So we were not liking, uh, we, we didn't have a specific target group in that specific uh, marketing project. And, and uh, 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 not on the paper, uh, because uh, maybe uh, we had, you know, um, uh, in, in the approach meaning, uh, which you also started uh, about talking about, Larry, which was how can we work with uh, historical films, making them relevant today. And I think this Rebel Tour uh, 
um, and this also means uh, making it uh, relevant for people who didn't was part of the historical events uh, back then, which include ourselves. And uh, uh, so, so maybe what we gained of it was an uh, attraction or an interest from uh, uh, an, an audience that maybe didn't connect to this specific event, but by uh, uh, exposing the, the, the rebel and exposing it in uh, today's society, uh, maybe that was uh, a way, now I get the question, of working uh, with uh, an audience that was not the same as in our uh, more commercial uh, advertising focused campaign. Yeah, yeah. yeah Christina, yeah. Yeah, uh, I just want to <laughs> add because I think that, uh, that if, we, if we were supposed to do this tour once again with the learnings that we did, I think that one, one I, 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 first of all, I must say I'm, I'm, I'm so bored with the, with the whole um, way we think about the audiences in terms of age and the city or in the countryside or I think we have to develop a much more sensitive way of looking at the audience. So for instance, I think we could have succeeded if we had, uh, if, if with this other idea we had, um, which was to create um, like the curriculum for the school children, like maybe from 16 years to 18 years, like the high school. Uh, curriculum, uh, so which means that, that they like creating some material for the teachers in order to be able to uh, teach children uh, different things based on viewing the film. So what we could have done was to send this uh, curriculum material out to all the schools at the same time as the commercial launch for the audience, which was the commercial launch was for 40 years and up. So mm -hmm. we have a target like 60 to 19 year old school children with mm -hmm. this curriculum material and, and having a success criteria in creating a, a conversation between two generations about something that is um, a, a historical subject matter. Yeah. I think that would have been interesting if we had had the capacity and money and time but the next time we will do that. Definitely. Yeah, and I hope that people listening right now will steal this idea. That's yes. a great idea. Yeah, yeah, steal the idea. It's a good idea. I agree. Um, before I go over with that question to Dirk and Henriette, I just wanted to say, Jonas, you had a poster that you wanted to show. Maybe we want to bring that aspect of, the, of, the, of your campaign. You want to show that for a moment now and talk about it, or is it a, is yeah, shall we yeah, keep it for later? Yeah, it's fine to do it now. Um, um, yeah, we can put it on now. Yeah, can we um, see the poster and then you just tell us what, why you wanted us to see this? Yeah, but you know, it was actually just an illustration uh, uh, of, uh, you know, this is a, um, a reversed version of our uh, original uh, concept art uh, uh, for the film, the key art. And um, uh, we, we uh, came up with the idea, uh, again, to make it uh, bold, this Rebel Tour that we actually uh, developed uh, a kind of a tour poster. Um, um, also because uh, many of the names that you see on the posters uh, are uh, very uh, household and well-known uh, names in Denmark, uh, which like like Thompson is a very uh, mm -hmm. household name, uh, but just to, to kind of show that the Rebel Tour we did was a, a mix between uh, local unknowns uh, um, and also uh, very well known and to uh, kind of um, take advantage of that um, people might, hopefully they were curious to the film, uh, just because of the film, uh, but, but at, that we could put on an add-on uh, to what experience uh, it could be to go to these special events because it's people that are known uh, for both being entertaining and wise and philosophic and rebel. Um, so, so that was actually the idea. Uh, we kind of created a special um, uh, campaign promoting this tour. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, I will definitely come back to you uh, with more questions. There's questions from the audience, and I have so many questions that there might not be time to ask them all. But for the moment, I just want to go back to Henriette and to Dirk. And uh, so don't go anywhere. Yeah? Christina, stay here. Don't stay be too here. rebellious. <laughs> and I'll go back uh, to Henriette and Dirk. 
And I'll start uh, with asking you the same question that we had uh, in the chat about age group, a very specific question, but it would be interesting for us to know in the plans that you developed, how to connect like really deeply with a potentially narrow but very present and very engaged audience. Did age play a role at all or was that not relevant for you? De Henriette, maybe? I don't know if that question is more for you or... Um, yeah, um, I'm thinking because age did not really play a big role because the target group of the Danish minority is basically of every age because the Danish minority, I mean, it's, it's not an ethnicity or anything, it's passed on through generations. So, I mean, obviously the film is not targeted at children or people of a very young age, but generally I would say that um, it's we didn't target a specific age group, but everyone within that um, group of people belonging to the Danish minority. So, I mean, Dirk can maybe say a few words about the attendance. Um, he went to a few screenings as uh, Tom was in Berlin Kreuzberg and uh, Casper from Denmark. So um, Dirk took over um, and went uh, to uh, a few screenings. So maybe uh, Dirk can say a few things about that, of what people he met there. Yeah. I can definitely tell uh, whom we uh, reached uh, with our film. So, um, yeah, it, uh, we, uh, I think uh, Henriette is right. We were not really focusing on a specific uh, age group, but we noticed um, or we knew that the film is more addressing uh, the 40 plus uh, audience. And that's also what we saw in the cinema. Um, the people uh, were mostly from the older generations and that uh, the film resonated a lot with them. And we had even feedback that uh, people knew uh, uh, people from when they were children, uh, people who went to World War I and uh, who still have all those stories in, in mind. So we, we, I think we, it was not a surprise and we knew from the beginning that this is uh, our, our main focus. Uh, we also, uh, like Christina said, uh, had the idea of creating uh, material for school and to uh, have the film also released in, in a school context. Um, but then uh, we had the age rating, uh, which was 16, and that uh, made it much more difficult yeah. to really get into this uh, field of action. Okay. okay. I'm just going to continue with another question to the two of you. Um, there was the question, and this might be a bit painful to talk about because it's not happening as you have planned it, but uh, Christiane Gern was asking in the chat if there was a different communication approach planned for southern Germany or for the west of Germany, let's call it that way. Um, I'm sure there was, but it would be interesting, I think, for us to hear a bit how differently you would have approached or hoped to approach the rest of the country. Uh, I think this anchor that you have into the Danish speaking minority in the north, uh, northern part of the country is very clear. And I think this makes sense and also connects it back to the, what Christina said about like really connecting and taking seriously like limited audiences and engaging with them on a deep level. But uh, maybe if you can like tell us a bit about the plans that you had and maybe also about like if these plans uh, if you're hoping to adapt these plans for the future and how. I, I, I leave that question open to you, but maybe Dirk started to say something. So should we start with you, Dirk? Yeah, I can, I can start. Um, so um, I, I think that uh, yeah, our plan was to really address um, this uh, audience in the northern Germany through their cultural identity that we, uh, we portray in the film. Uh, but the film's uh, topic or the theme uh, is a wide, much broader one, um, and um, the, the whole idea or the, the, the story of the border um, and the story of a peaceful border, uh, of an open border, um, and the fact that uh, 100 years after these events happened and uh, after those two countries were very, very much uh, opposed uh, we are able today to make films together and to produce uh, cultural to create our, our culture together uh, that is uh, something that uh, we hoped to transport also to the southern uh, part of germany and uh, to focus on um, this positive aspect uh, of uh, history 
Henrietta, do you want to add something or? No, I can just, um, we talked about this um, beforehand, before the panel, and um, it's exactly what Dirk said, like the concept of borders and how borders are becoming nowadays um, more important again, and which is a shame basically. And we talk about uh, borders in America to Mexico, we talk about Brexit, and um, now due to Corona, we talk about borders being closed again, mm. even borders within Germany that um, don't exist and borders in Europe that to us Europeans don't exist. So, um, yeah, that was really something um, we wanted to set a focus on because it's on many, many levels very important um, in Germany nowadays, I think. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And I think this really brings us to maybe the next topic that we could talk about. I think uh, in both of your case studies, it became really clear um, that like connecting to a cultural identity or cultural values, as uh, Christina and uh, Jonas mentioned in the first case, is really something that can help bring like a period piece or like a historical film or a film about a subject from the past uh, closer to our reality and connect people to it emotionally. Um, what I think is a really, a really interesting aspect is uh, this idea of local identity, of national, of regional, of national identity, and how we can, after taking the local audiences seriously and connecting with them, how possibly and potentially films like this can transcend their national realm that like connects to it more closely. And, uh, and make it into like other parts of the country or other parts of the, of the world, other parts of Europe, other parts of the world, and uh, cross over borders. Um, um, I think in your case, you mentioned a bit the different approaches in Denmark, connecting it to like a Danish historical event. Uh, you mentioned how you wanted to, or how you were planning to like connect to the audiences here and how you managed to do that as well. And then like maybe didn't get to, like earn the fruits of all that labor, but hopefully in the future you will do that. But I would really love to bring that back uh, also to Christina and to Jonas to ask them a bit about like how they potentially imagine as the producers of the film, um, how that would work for their film. They are just coming out of the experience of the Danish release. Christina, there you are back again. And there's Jonas. Um, yeah, so as the producers, I would be really interested to see if you imagine that the approach that you took, which is not necessarily linked to like the national identity of the film, but to something bigger, like a cultural, generally human concept, this rebel tour that you did, do you think this would be a potential way in other territories, other countries uh, to work on release as well? What's your experience with that and what are you hoping or expecting as much as you can predict in these times for the like international career of the film that starts that's just beginning right now yeah um i think uh, an example uh, because we have discussed this now what we have specifically gained and uh, experience uh, about is working local with this way of uh, exposing cultural value but we have been discussing uh, with the, uh, the uh, foreign ministry in Denmark, uh, how to get the film out to all the embassies, the, all the Danish embassies uh, around the world, um, because they, uh, uh, Kaufman is a, a, a very well-known and bold, uh, diplomat that um, uh, they really want to help uh, uh, expose, you know, both to, uh, to the Danish citizens because he's not well-known. He, uh, he is now, but uh, prior, uh, very few knew about him. And uh, I had a conversation with, uh, with one of uh, uh, the press um, uh, agents uh, at the Foreign Ministry, where I told her about this rebel tour uh, that we did in Denmark. And then she uh, uh, came up with the uh, idea or, yeah, idea that maybe that could be rolled out to uh, embassy event screenings around the world uh, because uh, of course it also uh, kind of um, taps into a very uh, specific theme that uh, at least is very active I think for diplomats which uh, is um, uh, this dilemma uh, if you can be uh, what can you say raised above the law in a good faith um, uh, 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 case 
Um, so uh, there, I think that could be a way of answering your question and also for us to work on it uh, in an international context uh, because uh, rebel is not a Danish phenomenon. It will be understood all over the world. And um, now with the idea from uh, the embassy headquarters themselves rolling it out, that could uh, be a way of getting an experience working with it in an uh, international context. Yes, Christina, you want to add something? Yeah, no, it just when you ask about the, the local side of our tour, I think that just us, like me, traveling to all these places and being there and, and spending time and, and having a, a local conversation, I think that in itself uh, sort of strengthens the local um, engagement. So I think, I think it's not only a question of using the topic for your strategy that it has a local viewpoint. I also think just the, the, just the totally banal thing, just traveling out and be, be there, spend time with them. Meet the cinema owners. Maybe he wants to take your next film on his screen. Uh, maybe you could come back and talk about other stuff with the audience. Uh, just starting to build a relationship instead of staying at home and then just let other people um, introduce your work. So, so I think I think there's I think there's a lot of, of like really stupid and small, really practical, but also those small barriers that if we could identify them, we could connect much faster and stronger with the audience. And I think that that um, we have now had a long period of social media, and, and um, you know, you ask uh, different people, what does engagement mean? A lot of people will say that engagement is if you click like on a post on Facebook. But, but and, and we had a discussion about that, like a deep discussion, what do we, how do we define engagement? And engagement for us is not some, somebody retweeting a tweet or like, giving a like to our Facebook or liking our trailer. Engagement is to meet the audience and when the meeting is over, the audience person is going out in their own life and start doing stuff in another way uh, that they did before they saw the film and had the conversation with us. That's engagement. That's like doing something physically different uh, in their life, you know, uh, doing something for the community, uh, the street they live in, the school they have the children in, you know, realizing their own rebel uh, quality and defending it in order to create society. That was the goal we had. So I think I think step one is to define engagement. What is it for us in this crew and with this strategy? Yeah. Thank you so much. One thing that I wanted to ask, and I think this moves a bit away from like different strategies of releasing historical films and get people engaged, as you mentioned it, uh, and it goes back more into the unprecedented, unpredictable times. Um, so the, the campaign you did and the tour you did was, of course, only possible because you could physically go there to these places and meet people and talk to the people. Could you have imagined or can you imagine for the international uh, career for your film to recreate this in some way in a virtual uh, environment, like a bit not as we're doing right now, but in a time where some people are just forced to stay at home and the way to engage is only via like media, social media, interactive connections. Can you imagine or do you have any plans how to like follow up on what you did physically in Denmark um, on a different level via screens? Christina, maybe uh, you start, or, yeah, no, you, go ahead, Jonas. Yeah, yeah. Uh, go ahead, Christina. You start. Go ahead, Christina, yes. I shut up. Uh, okay, so I, I, I actually think, uh, I think we should fight for the physical meeting. Um, and of course, this could be a streamed event as well. But I think, I still think that the streamed event would be, uh, I, I still would like to fight for the physical event. And I, and I also think that because there has not been a lot of um, disease uh, mechanisms inside the, the theaters, they, 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 are, they are still safe places. Um, so I think we should, uh, we should go very far before we jump to the stream it. That's my personal. Thank you. Jonas, do you want to add something? No, I think uh, Christina's point should uh, stand clear. 
I think, uh, I mean, we here at the festival this year, we lost the fight for the physical, but uh, we're definitely on your side in that, so I don't think we have to uh, discuss that much further. I would like to give back the question to the other side of the panel, so I'm mm -hmm. going to move back over here again. And um, just have uh, maybe a last question or like a last part of the conversation with Dirk and Henriette. So right now you're really in the middle of it, uh, kind of the same questions. Were there plans or are there plans, scenario F or G or H, or I don't know which plan you're at right now, uh, to move uh, whatever you started doing so successfully into the virtual realm? Uh, Dear yeah, you? definitely. Uh, so that's something uh, Yeah, we, we uh, need to react in a way. We only were for like for a few weeks in, in the cinema and it was that was already very hard um, and it was very rewarding as well on the other hand so I can agree with Christina that uh, that uh, it's so important to uh, to have this physical content uh, context and uh, to have the relationship with the audience also with the cinema owners with the people working in the cinemas it was really that was a, a very positive uh, thing about the whole campaign that we did um, to to see and meet the people working in the industry, uh, the journalists, uh, people fighting for films and fighting for cinemas and uh, uh, for this very special place and to experience uh, this place during the pandemic and uh, meeting the audience, talking to them, um, that uh, was very fulfilling. And it was something that uh, we would love to continue on on a way. Um, unfortunately, at the moment, we are not uh, able to, and I'm not sure when uh, we will be able again in Germany to to have these uh, these meetings um, with the audience. So we are definitely thinking about um, other ways of uh, uh, connecting with the audience and maybe to move the film to the digital world. Maybe uh, Henriette can add a few things because mm -hmm. she experienced something with another film uh, earlier this year and uh, there she made this move uh, very uh, successfully, actually. Um, yes, in, we released at the beginning of the year after I went to the notary um, at the end of uh, February we released a documentary about a German um, YouTuber slash singer and um, we started quite successfully and uh, were about to release in 200 uh, cinemas and then unfortunately uh, Corona took over and we did a digital release um, for that film and we made a marketing campaign out of like support your local cinema and we donated uh, a quarter of um, the money that was paid for each online ticket to the cinema that the person who bought the ticket would have gone to. So we were able to um, donate over a quarter of a million euros to German cinemas, which was great. And obviously in the process of this film, we talked about the possibilities of not doing the same thing, obviously, but doing something comparable or moving the film online. But it's not as easy done with that target group as with the target group I was able to work with before. So um, we quickly realized that the, let me say, the a member of the German, uh, of the Danish minority might not be the person that buys an online ticket um, and watches the film online. So I think you always have to evaluate who is your target group and how do they move about online? And um, as Dirk already said, the the possibility to talk about the to talk to these people offline and for them to meet at an offline place, which is the great thing about cinemas, um, we thought was more important than just putting the film online and hoping that just a few other people would see it. So yeah. we really wanted to stick to our initial plan and our initial theory that um, this will work well in like the offline place of cinemas. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. Um, 
I think there's a few comments in the chat from Deraj who also wanted to, thanks for that, who wanted to know if you feel there's a big difference um, with feature films and documentaries. This moves away a bit from our topic since like both historical films we have as case studies today are feature films. But maybe you just want to, if you have a quick idea, if documentaries with historical subjects would be, have to, tr would have to be treated any differently or if you think it does not make such a big difference if it's a fiction or a documentary. I don't know if you are the right people to ask this question, so <laughs> that's why I didn't ask it, because I don't know how much you are involved in documentary features. So. I haven't done a historical documentary, so um, I'm really, I don't think I'm the right person to ask right. here. So we'll have to ask Deraj in some other moment, because I think he did, and he shared some of his experience also, how he worked with like um, schools a lot, uh, but I, I, his film is called Wars Don't End, so he's been in Norwegian schools, he tells us in the chat. But unfortunately, we can't have him come in here right now. We're not that spontaneous. He, if he would be in the audience, he could have jumped up and said something. But in this virtual format, unfortunately, we'll have to see that at some other moment, that input. Thank you so much anyway. Um, um, I want to say thank you for you and to you, not for you, also for you, but to you. And. Um, <laughs> With this, I'll move back to Christina and Jonas to say goodbye to them and then end this uh, panel at some moment. Uh, I think it's uh, wonderful to have you. It was wonderful to have you here, and uh, we hope that we will uh, soon win the fight for the physical experience of being in a cinema together again and in a room together again to discuss. But as the second best thing, I was very happy to have you both here with me on screens today. So thank you so much. And uh, so much. we'll hope to see you very soon in real life. And good luck with everything that's hopefully going to follow. <laughs> and um, with this, I want to say goodbye to Christina and to Jonas as well. If you have any closing words, I think we all agree uh, that uh, there's lots of things that are unpredictable, that it's important to find ways into audiences, into communities, by relating whatever film you have, historical or from the present, to their cultural values, to their communities, to their ideas of uh, what's important in life right now. Um, but um, yes, if you have any closing words that you wanted to add, this would be your state right now. Well, I could say, um, <clears throat> I think what it has been a very good uh, example of and good experience of um, uh, this uh, uh, process uh, with working with cultural value has been um, to, as filmmaker, to deeply engage and involve yourself in, in taking all those kind of full responsibility for the whole process of the film, uh, both the making of it and the distribution of it and the impact you expect it to make in society and to the audience. Yeah. Wonderful. And I just want to say, as a director, I mean, you can do like, uh, like big things with films in the film's afterlife and many more things that have been done now if you have a good collaboration with the producer. And yeah. I think because we have such a close uh, working relationship and I love my producer and adore him very much and, uh, and we have a friendship also, I think that's the key, uh, that we can have this kind of open conversation about uh, when are we good, when are we not good, when, when are we relevant to the audience, when are we irrelevant to the audiences, we need to have been able to have these talks in order to create the best strategy. So I think a, a working relationship which is strong between director and producer is absolutely key to success in this, um, yeah. in this uh, meeting the audience. Wonderful, thank you. Um, for everybody who's watching us from Germany, I just wanted to mention that you can still watch all over Germany the film that Christina made and that you both collaborated or made together. Uh, you can still watch it on the website of the Nordische Filmtage Lübeck. Um, uh, and also tomorrow on Saturday the 8th at 8 p.m. Uh, we will stream our award show uh, live, so you can be a part of that as well, and then maybe see Christina and Jonas again. Well, I'm, I don't know yet, so well, fingers crossed for you. Uh, fingers mm -hmm. crossed for the international uh, career of your film, and uh, most of all, fingers crossed that, uh, yeah, as I said, we're going to win this fight for the physical reality of cinema uh, very soon and uh, forever, and can continue to meet and come together uh, over borders uh, and, uh, yeah, just come together again. 
uh, to see films and discuss films ag uh, together again. And uh, thank you so much for taking the time to being with us here. Uh, it was really thank lovely you for to have you. And uh, mm -hmm. we'll see you hopefully uh, very soon. I'm keeping my fingers crossed and all the best for you. Huh? I'm waving at your Bye -bye. screens now, right now. So, <laughs> so um, with this, we're also coming to the end of the panel. Uh, I want to say thank you to everybody who was watching at home. Uh, we could interact a little bit, but not as much as I would have wished for, but uh, we'll hopefully do that again very soon. Um, I wanted to thank again the partners that made this panel possible. I did mention them in the beginning already, uh, so I'm not going to do that again. For everybody watching who missed something or wanted to watch it again, you can watch this panel as a catch-up uh, on the same link that you have. Um, so you can scroll back to the moment where I mentioned the partners that I was thanking and play that again. And um, to everybody else, um, I wanted to say thank you for the audiences at home. And um, with this, uh, we're coming to the end of this panel and I'm wishing you a very wonderful day. And uh, yeah, please feel free to join on the website of Nordische Film Tage Lübeck to see the films, uh, not only The Good Traitor, but maybe especially, and all the other films we have to offer. Thank you and uh, I hope to see you soon.